peace and welcome in the name of Jesus Christ here to Blacksburg United Methodist Church on our Church Street campus. Uh, my name is Brad Delaney. I'm the lead pastor here, and along with Pastor Jennifer Fletcher, we want to welcome you to this online service that uh, leads us into Holy Week. Uh, particularly glad for those of you who may be joining us as guests today. Uh, if you take a moment to click over, there's a guest uh, form. We would love for you to take a moment to provide information. We have a special gift we would love to share with you, so if you take a moment to do that, we would be grateful. Today is the first Sunday of what's called Holy Week, as we walk with Jesus through the events of his passion, his death, and ultimately next Sunday on Easter, his resurrection. Today is Palm Sunday, and normally for Palm Sunday, we would have special palms to wave as we sing together loud hosanna. But uh, today, being that we are worshiping virtually, I would encourage you to make use of the palm cross that many of you received a number of weeks back in our Lenten toolkit. So I encourage you to take that out. You can pin it to yourself or, or just place it with the candle in your worship center as we together join in worship on this Palm Sunday. And speaking of Holy Week, at the conclusion of today's service, Pastor Jennifer will be explaining all of our Holy Week services on Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and our Easter offerings. Uh, and so hope that you'll stick around for that, and particularly for our Easter Sunday services, because we want you to be a part, whether through our virtual service or through one of our two in-person services that we'll be doing at different locations in the town of Blacksburg. So stick around to hear more details. The coordinators of the Margaret Beeks Elementary School Partnership are seeking individuals with a passion for gardening who can coordinate the care and maintenance of the raised garden beds at Margaret Beeks Elementary School. If you are interested, you can check out the weekly email to learn more and to sign up. Please join with me in the call to worship. You can participate using the words in bold as they appear on your screen. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Please join with me in the opening prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, on this day your Son Jesus Christ entered the holy city of Jerusalem and was proclaimed king by those who spread their garments and palm branches along his way. Let those branches be for us signs of his victory, and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our Lord and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. In his name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is Austin, and I love St. Jesus. Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little children sing. Through pillared court and temple, the lovely anthem ring. To Jesus who had blessed them, most holy to his breast, the children sing. Thank you. 
Palm Sunday, and it is the beginning of Holy Week. So today we're going to talk about a special parade that happened on the very first Palm Sunday, where Jesus came riding in on a very important animal. Do you know what animal that was? Now, there were some people who thought that he would come riding in on a war horse. Some people thought that he would come in just really importantly on something big and mighty. And Jesus came riding in on what they used, what animals they used for work. He came in on a donkey. Yes. This is not the donkey that Jesus rode on, but Jesus rode on a donkey because he was a different kind of king. People thought that Jesus would come in and he would have on he would come in and he would have on this golden crown and he would have on this royal outfit and he would come in mighty on this war horse and he would take charge and tell everybody what to do, but Jesus came in on a donkey, a donkey that people would have been used to seeing. So he came in on something very ordinary and regular, and he talked to people about their real lives, what was happening with them. And he talked to them about how much God loved them. So he's a very different kind of king and the best king of all. And so when people saw Jesus, they threw a parade. And it was a different kind of parade than we've seen. We didn't have big balloons and floats and um, confetti. They threw their coats on the ground, kind of like the red carpet would be. And they grabbed branches off the tree and they waved their branches. And the kinds of trees they had there were palm trees. That's how we get Palm Sunday. And they shouted, Hosanna, which means save us. Because they knew Jesus was different and he was special and they knew that he could do something for their hearts, that he could save them. And so today we began this special Holy Week remembering that Jesus is a different kind of king and he is for us. That he cares about our regular, ordinary lives and he cares about us and he is in our lives to remind us that God loves us. So this week, I hope you'll remember Presley and I hope you'll remember the donkey that Jesus rode on and those who shouted, Hosanna, save us. Dear God, thank you for donkeys that remind us of your real and ordinary love and for Jesus, our real and ordinary and amazing and powerful Savior. Hosanna. Amen. Throughout the season of Lent, we have been keeping and celebrating everyday divinity, these beautiful moments in our everyday lives when God shows up and opens our eyes to the goodness and the beauty and the love of God in and around us through Jesus Christ. Uh, and we wanna share with you a number of photos that you have shared through our social media platforms, photos where you have captured moments of everyday divinity. Uh, extraordinary moments and common moments. So just want to take a moment for you to see these and, uh, and to just relish how through the past weeks we together have been journeying to understand more deeply how Christ reveals Christ's self in these everyday moments. I want to express gratitude for all the financial support you continue to provide for the ministries of our church. Uh, it provides for things like uh, our social media support and our communications ministries, which are so vitally important. So I encourage you, if you haven't done so, to drop over to our online giving page and to give to support there or to just drop a check by. Or next Sunday, if you're gonna be joining us for Easter at the Lot 3 campus on Virginia Tech, you can bring an offering in person there as well. 
And speaking of that service, I want to encourage you to help us spread the word. We have several Facebook events set up for the Easter services. You know, Easter is one of the few times throughout the year when people who may not really have a church connection or any Christian commitment may actually dare show up to hear the story of this amazing God who has come to us through Jesus Christ. And friends, you have relationships with those people through your social media. All it takes is for you to share that event, to share the video that tells about our Lot 3 service next Sunday. Uh, and particularly if you share it specifically with certain friends, the impact is huge. So use this as an opportunity for us to live into our baptismal vows of uh, helping other people to experience the good news that we have through Christ. Today's scripture lesson is from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem and Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and you will immediately, as you enter it, you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it to If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near the door outside in the street. And they, as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing to untying the colt? 
they told them what Jesus had said and they allowed him to take it. They brought the, then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road. Others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. And they entered Jerusalem and he went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Some days when I leave the office and head home for the day, I find myself really kind of rushing to try to get things done for the evening, to spend time with my family while also taking care of some things around the house. Some evenings look something like this. end of my day can sometimes feel like a crash landing. That my day began in a flurry of activity, launching into my day like a pinball, bouncing me from one thing to the next, my brain spinning like a whirly gig in a hurricane, stumbling over interruptions, tripping over my busyness until I finally collapse in the bed at the end of the day, only to then wake up and start the whole cycle over again. You know, I suspect that many of us have entire days, maybe even entire weeks, that repeat this similar pattern. Many of you know at least something of what I'm talking about here. We, we live in this very high-pressure, hyper-busy world where there's little time or space to breathe or reflect or to seek out God. Interestingly, when COVID hit a year ago and the world just kind of came to this crashing halt, I heard many people talking about what a gift it was during those months of quarantine. The gift of slowing down enough to realize how insane our previous pace of life was. It's interesting, over the past months as restrictions are easing, schools moving back, athletics getting geared up, uh, people traveling again to see family after vaccines, our pace of life is picking back up again. And honestly, we're grateful, right? I mean, we're breathing this sigh of relief. Finally, we can get back to some things that we love. But I even saw someone post on Facebook this week their excitement over having their first real scheduling conflict in over a year. Yes, it's so exciting, isn't it? But I want to close this Everyday Divinity series by helping us not ignore the lessons that this time has offered us. I want us to lay hold of the gifts that we have received and to carry them with us into the future. Because, look, here is the honest to God truth. For very many of us, our previous way of life was unsustainable. 
And before we fall back into our old patterns and old behaviors, let's take advantage of this moment. I believe that, that one of the primary reasons we love to keep busy and hectic is this, to avoid the bigger questions of life to avoid the pain and sorrow we may feel, to, to avoid the problems we may have in our marriages or our families or relationships, to avoid the realities that life is short and that someday we will die. And to avoid this, we just keep ourselves occupied with these urgent, immediate tasks so much so that we don't have the time or space or bandwidth for the important eternal things. Thinking about eternal matters is hard stuff because it usually demands something of us, something of me, for us to do something differently with our lives, that, that we might grow in our capacity to live life to its fullest, that we maybe pour ourselves into the things that really bring joy, that, that we would show up into the world wholeheartedly, embracing it with all of its ugliness and its beauty, its brokenness and its holiness, trusting that God is in that. That's hard stuff. And so it's much easier to just kind of stay caught up in the swirl of activity, bouncing from one thing to the next throughout our day, pushing so hard that we crash when we get to the day's end without having given much thought to our lives. What if you approach the end of each day as a rehearsal for your final journey, preparing yourself for a new day to dawn? What if instead of a crash landing, you and I laid down our lives in a spirit of faith and hope and love, slowing down long enough to really see and be seen by God? As with the day's beginning, what if we receive the end of this day as an opportunity to start anew? You know, as Jesus came into Jerusalem, it was the beginning of the end for him. But his life did not come to a crashing halt. He doesn't rush in to, to do the deed and get on with things. No, Jesus' final days, they embody such wisdom, a wisdom that we can absorb as we walk with him today and over the coming days. There's a wisdom by God's grace that can enable us to approach the end of each day as a moment of tender reflection of honest truth-telling, of sacred closure that can really pave the path for a new beginning. Now on Sunday, Jesus enters Jerusalem on a colt, surrounded by these adoring crowds of his followers. And, and as he comes in, they wave and they shout, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the one who's coming in the kingdom of our ancestor David, Hosanna in the highest heavens. They are welcoming this king, heralding the one who is truly the Messiah. And it's interesting, in the other Gospels, once Jesus makes it into town, he goes straight away and starts causing trouble in the temple, overturning the tables of the money changers and all that. But that's not what happens here in Mark. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, it was already late, so he went out to Bethany with his 12 disciples. I love this moment. You know, he has arrived, the king, and he has so much work to do. But after the grand entrance, he just comes into the city, goes into the temple. He just walks around. He just takes it all in, like a tourist walking into the Lincoln Memorial for the first time. He concludes the first day by then returning to the village of Bethany with his disciples. Now, we see this pattern repeated over and over during the Holy Week. He goes into the city with his disciples to do work. In fact, the next day in Mark, he overturns the table of the money changers in the temple. He goes and teaches in the temple about things that really matter, like from last week's story about the greatest commandment. He comes and he brings grace to the hearts of the crowds who are longing for a word of hope. And he speaks truth to the religious leaders who don't like him and who are seeking his demise. He comes in, he does the work, and then in the evenings he returns out to the village of Bethany, which is outside the city of Jerusalem. 
One evening, as they were reclining at the table there in Bethany for the meal, a, a woman comes in with this jar of really expensive ointment. She breaks it open and anoints Jesus with it. And the disciples, they criticize her because it was a luxurious waste of money in their opinion. But Jesus says, now hang on a second. She has done something beautiful for me. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Then a few days later, on Thursday, the first day of Passover, Jesus and the disciples gather, not in Bethany, but in an upper room in a house inside Jerusalem. He sits at table and he teaches them. In John's Gospel, many chapters of teaching, trying to prepare the disciples for his impending death. And as a parting gift, he offers to them the gift of his very self. Taking the bread, he blessed and broke, and he gives it to them. And similarly with the cup. And he says, take, eat, drink. This is my body. This is my blood. It is given for you. And from there, they then retreat out to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus has this honest, gut-wrenching prayer with his disciples who just keep falling asleep because they're clueless. Let this cup pass from before me, Jesus prays. Yet, 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 not what I want, but what you want, O Lord. Then Judas shows up with the religious leaders in an angry crowd. Judas steps forward to betray Jesus with a kiss. And from here, things move swiftly. Arrest, abandonment, trial. Peter's denial of him, the crowds jeering against him, Pilate washing his hands of him, Jesus stripped, whipped, beaten, spat upon, mocked, nailed to a cross publicly strung up there for six hours of naked humiliation and pain. And all the while, Jesus says so very little, like a lamb before its shears is silent. And the few words he speaks, are of comfort, of honesty, of grace. Father, forgive them. Today you will be with me in paradise. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as he nears the end, he cries out with a loud cry and breathes his last. And the centurion, who gazes upon how Jesus dies in this way, says, Surely this man was the Son of God. The women who had been looking on were pierced to the heart. Joseph of Arimathea, he goes to Pilate and asks for the body. Joseph then buys a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid, carefully laid in the tomb, but not yet anointed for burial. It's as if the story is not quite yet over. It's hinting that it's not yet complete. But what's fascinating is the story comes to a close here on Good Friday, Jesus' ending is not hasty, it's not hurried, it's not rushed. Yes, it was disastrous, it was a perversion of justice, but it was not a crash landing. In John chapter 10, Jesus helps us to better understand really what was going on, what was happening as he lays down his life. He says, I am the good shepherd. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. Jesus lays down his life in an intentional way. And by God's grace, you and I can lay down our lives to take hold of the life that really is life. You know, we end each day 
by doing just what Jesus was describing, lying down, laying down our lives. Now, I'm not suggesting that we think of our sleep as death, but that we use these moments as Jesus did for a soft landing that we would approach our sleeping moments as Jesus approached this final week of his own life, what would it look like for you and I to approach the end of our days with this kind of wisdom and this kind of care and love so that you're not crashing at the end of the day, but that you're truly laying yourself down in a a beautiful and trusting, intentional way? I, I was introduced to a spiritual practice several years back called the daily examine. It's a short five-step process that in a lot of ways helps carve out that space as you approach your sleeping, the end of your day. If you received our Lenten toolkit in the mail, the daily examine prayer was printed on a special card and I encourage you to take that out. I keep a card like this beside my bed as a reminder for me to take even five minutes as I end my day in prayerful reflection. The first step is to simply become aware of God's presence in that moment. Then secondly, to look back over the day with gratitude and just treasure and relish the wonderful gifts that God gave you in the course of that day. The third step is to take an honest look at those moments that were maybe harder and the emotions that they stirred. Maybe it was a failure that you experienced or a disappointment. The fourth step is to focus on one part of the day that seems to emerge to your attention and and really just pray over it for a few moments to lift it to God and to seek wisdom. And then the fifth and final step is to lift a prayer for tomorrow, asking for God's guidance and presence, trusting that God is already in tomorrow. Now, I have to say, I don't do this regularly, but when I do practice this daily exam, I'm surprised by the impact. I sleep more soundly that night. And then the next morning, I wake up feeling more connected and alive and free. And this can be especially powerful if you pair it with journaling. Now, if you're interested in learning more about the daily exam, we have a small group here at our church that meets regularly by Zoom to encourage and support one another in doing the daily exam. You can find more information on this through our online Lenten Toolkit. The philosopher Socrates, as he faced the prospect of his own death, he famously said, the unexamined life is not worth living. I think the wisdom that Jesus offers to us in how we live our lives is so deep and rich. And practices like the daily exam can help us to take hold of a life that really is life. Because friends, here's the truth. One day will be your last day. None of us has any promises that that will be a long time from now, no reassurances about how many days we have left. And being in touch with this reality can help us take the long view to help you when you're tempted to dive back into post-pandemic at breakneck speed, Christ calls you back to your true self, back to sanity, back to abundant life. When we give ourselves some space in our everyday lives to just pause and to reflect, to, we, we can see ourselves so much more clearly and we can hear God's voice more clearly as well and discover a fullness of life that we didn't have before. We can live fuller, richer, live more alive even as we face the realities of death. To help us understand what it looks like, I wanna tell you a story about Jan McKenzie. Jan was someone I knew some years ago, and when you were in Jan's presence, you realized you were in the presence of a marvelous human being. She really saw you and was fully present to you, and she would take delight in who you were. Now, Jan had severe breathing issues, and, and near the end of her life, she was hospitalized with, and, and had to have really high levels of oxygen. Um, her lungs were so weak and unable to provide the oxygen that her blood needed for her body. And it was clear at one point that there was not much more that could be done. Her her lungs were just decimated by disease. She'd been hospitalized for a very long time and she had maybe hours or days to live. And yet, 
Each time I went to see her as her pastor, she was constantly asking about me and my family and how we were. She wasn't trying to avoid talking about her own death. She was just really be, being present to me. She was totally in her right mind, and she asked if she could go home to die. Now, due to her poor oxygen saturation, she required 35 liters of oxygen, and that is far more than any medical transport at that time could handle. I want to say, friends, it is a beautiful thing to acknowledge someday that we'll die. It helps you to realize how precious, how tender and fragile is life. The gift of a single day on this earth is such a precious gift. Because the fullness of God dwells in a very complete way in every single moment of every day of our lives. If we take the time to breathe, to pause, to look, to listen, to just feel, we can go from just living to really being alive. That's the gift of God's grace through Jesus Christ. God wants nothing more for us than for us to know that life, eternal, abundant, even now, today. So as we walk into this Holy Week, we're invited to walk with Christ. Even as Christ walks with us through the times that we have crosses thrust upon us in this life, this story is our story. And we each will face death, whether in an instant or over a long drawn out season. And we will each face loss in, in people that we care deeply about. The question for us is really, in those moments, will we pause and truly be present to God and to the people around us in those moments? Because when we can be, we are present to God and we are fully alive. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, as we go to the Lord in prayer, let's remember all of those who are on our prayer list, especially those who are receiving medical care. We lift up Amy Dodds as she is anticipating surgery this week. And we remember those who are in a season of grief, especially the family of Mark Dahlman, who died on March 17th. We also grieve with the families of the victims of the shootings in Atlanta and Colorado and the communities that have been affected by these acts of violence. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Loving God, we remember this today. All of those who are receiving medical care, especially Amy Dodds as she anticipates surgery, this coming week. Lord, we ask that you would meet each of these in their place of need, bringing comfort and healing and hope. We lift up those who are in a season of grief, especially the family of Mark Dahlman. Lord, comfort them in the ways that only you can. We lament the shootings that have taken place in Atlanta and Colorado. We pray, Lord, for the families of the victims and the communities that have been affected by these senseless acts of violence. We pray, Lord, for an end to gun violence, and we look forward to that day when there will be no more violence, when we will live in peace. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, as we enter into Holy Week, I'd like to quickly remind you of our Easter and Holy Week worship opportunities. You must pre-register for services that are held over Zoom or in person. On Maundy Thursday, we have two opportunities to worship and celebrate Holy Communion. One that is in person at 5.30 and another that is virtual at 7 p.m. On Good Friday, we premiere a pre-recorded Good Friday service. It'll be available all day and will feature the Stations of the Cross. On Easter Sunday, we have three opportunities. One is virtual, will premiere at 11 a.m. on our YouTube channel. We have our Easter sunrise service at 645 at the Hill at the Blacksburg Municipal Golf Course, and also our 11 a.m. Easter worship service, which will be held at Lot 3, the Southgate Lot at Virginia Tech. We look forward to celebrating the risen Christ with you. Friends, go in peace to walk with Christ through the events of his suffering, his death, and his rising to glory. Amen.